Hey everyone, Kyle once again, and welcome back to another movie review for Halloween month, and this time we're reviewing another film I, I enjoyed this year, and that is of The Black Phone, released uh, in June earlier this year, and um, I enjoyed The Black Phone. A couple of nitpicks here and there, though, but overall I liked it. The Black Phone is directed by Scott Derrickson, who directed the first Doctor Strange movie, he directed Deliver Us From Evil with Eric Bana. He also directed the remake of The Day of the Earth Stood Still from 2008, which I wasn't a fan of. The fifth Hellraiser film, Inferno, that was his, that was his directorial debut. Um, he directed Sinister, which I was not a fan of, though. Um, he also directed the, the Exorcism of Emily Rose. But, um, so, Scott Derrickson, he's been a little bit hit and miss, though, but I like Deliver Us From Evil. Because that was told from a cop's perspective. That made it interesting. And I liked it. And Eric Bond did a good job in that movie. Um, I like. I enjoyed the first Doctor Strange film. Sally, though. Because the thing is, with, with Scott Derrickson, he was supposed to direct the multi the, the sequel, The Multiverse of Madness. But the thing is, he, you know, he wanted to be a, be a straightforward horror film, you know. More scary, right? But the stupid idiots... The stupid idiots at Marvel... I don't know if it's Kevin Feige or whoever, you know, they did not want that, you know, so due to creative differences, Scott Derrickson left, you know what? And then he decided to make, decided to make the black phone instead, which, you know what, he made the right decision, because, you know, how Marvel is now, is, is now run, being run full of idiots now, because it's, because it's either, it's either their way or the highway, you know? Because that was the same reason with Ed White, um, director Edgar Wright, you know, who did Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, right? Um, who was supposed to direct the first Ant-Man movie, right? But then he left, probably do a, a creative difference is the same thing, you know? And that's why they brought Peyton Reed in. So, I, I just, I just, I'm just tired of saying, uh, you know, if they want to make it a certain way, let them do, do it that way, you know? I would have been interested to see how Doc's, uh, Scott Derrickson's version of the Multiverse of Madness would have been, you know? Let them do what they want to do. This is one of the reasons why, I know this is off topic, though, but... Why Stanley Kubrick, you know, how he's always stood his ground, you know, with when he's making his movies, you know. He didn't want no studio, uh, well, I think especially Warner Brothers, because a lot of films were made by Warner Brothers. How, not to interfere with his work, you know, he was strict and he just put his foot down on that. That's what a lot of these uh, directors, well, uh, lack nowadays, you know. Stamping your imprint on your on, on movies. That's why things I like give credit to... to uh, Stanley Kubrick, may he rest in peace, you know, especially with The Shining and uh, Full Metal Jacket, Stan uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, you know, he's just had that, that just, you know, it's, do it, it's his film, do it, let him do it his way, you know, and lo and behold, you know, <laughs> even though it, with the thing with The Shining, you know, with, with Shelley Duvall and all that stuff, you know, but hey, the film came out, six, the, the, the film was, became a, an all-time classic, you know. But yeah, studios need to stop interfering. If the directors want to have to do, do it one way, let them do it, you know, okay? Because that's why, why that, that film, the 2015 Fantastic Four film, uh, failed because of studio interference with director Josh uh, Trank. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't blame for him to live, for leaving because because Marvel nowadays have been not that good anyway, you know. So, but anyway, getting back here, I think he did he did this film and he did a good job with the movie. And the film is also, it's also based on a short story by uh, Joe Hill, who it actually turns out he's actually the son of Stephen King. Um, which is like, oh wow, Joe Hill. Uh, which, um, he's, a, he's the son of Stephen King, and he wrote a short story on this. Well, there's a short story, I think it's a, sh yeah, I think it's a short story, I think it was. But, um, okay, wow. The son of Stephen King wrote, wrote, uh, wrote, uh, a story of... He wrote a story about this before being turned into a movie. Okay, and it turns out actually uh, Joe Hill. He's actually actually was in Creep Show when he was a when he was a kid. He was actually in Creep Show. I think one of the one of the anthologies was in Creep Show though. But he was in that. So yeah, I actually thought the kid who grew up to, who was Stephen Kingston would grow up to write this the story, The Black Phone, and then it gets turned into a movie. You know, which I did not know about. Now, uh, um, so. Yeah, so the son of Stephen King wrote this uh, story that would be made to this movie, you know. So, 
and okay, that was that was that was interesting because I didn't know that Joe Hill he was the the son of Stephen King, which I've always enjoyed Stephen King though. But even though he, uh, like I said, speaking of Stephen King, you know how much he hates his movie, the, the movie The Shining, you know, which going back with Stanley Kubrick, you know, but whatever. And the film stars Ethan Hawke. He's the villain in this. I thought it was a different role for him. And he did a good job as well. He was uh, this villain called The Grabber who's been uh, kidnapping and abducting uh, kids, right? And it takes place in the 70s. So I think it was the 78, I think it was. And the film looks like it, w it looked like it does take place in the 70s. And I thought the production design of that was uh, well done on that aspect. And you have these two kids who um, I thought the br their brother and sister, I thought they both did a good job as well likable as well um the the lead the, the the boy played by um get the his name his name is finney played by mason thames he did a good job um and the sister gwen played by madeline mcgraw i thought she did a good job as well and they have they have a they have of course they have an abusive father he's actually played by jeremy davies which, if I remember Jeremy, Jeremy Davis, I mostly remember him when he was in Saving Private Ryan. He played the character Upham. Upham, he was the guy. Um, he he was brought along, you know, to translate to translate the German ger the German language to Tom Hanks and his crew. And of course, the famous scene where um, he was I know he, he was he was either scared and he froze up, you know, when he was on the stairway when he heard one of his comrades. Um, you know, it's when when it was being that the Nazi was pushing the knife down into him, right? He was like, shh, right? And the Nazi just walked right past Jeremy Davis. That was up him until he finally killed that one uh, German soldier where that he lets go. Yeah, that was Jeremy Davis. He was up him from saving Private Ryan. So he's in this. He's the abusive father because the 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 brother and sister they lost their mother and. That's one of the reasons why he was became abusive guy because uh, cause the like, the mother had dreams and now the sister had dreams right and he would beat her, and then um, Gwen he, he would beat Gwen, and then the brother Finney, he is he is bullied as well at at school you know by the people and he just like he like he's like what was it um he's in a shell basically he just stays in a shell you know not standing up for himself. And until one day when he gets kidnapped by the Grabber, played by Ethan Hawke, or what you have like this white makeup on when he's not wearing the mask, you know, and this wearing this top hat. And he did a good job, uh, Ethan Hawke as well. And he gets to take to, to, to his place, put in this basement, and there's basically a, a, a bare basement, basically nothing around except there's a phone, now one of those old uh, revolving uh, phones, right? It doesn't work, but when he gets a call, he he only receives them. He can call because it's broken, but he receives calls, and the calls he's been getting from is from the other past abducted children that he killed. And sometimes they're, they're seeing their they're seeing their ghosts as well, and they're kind of like giving him clues, you know, to how to try to escape. Although they all fail every time because if that if they did succeed, then the movie would be over, right? So. But of course, they so they have to fail. Like one, like he tries to go through the window, or tries to the hole in the wall, or one time he tries to sneak past the guy who's who's pretend to be asleep, or there's a lock code, but he gets it, but there's a dog, so then they all fail it every time, you know. And the whole thing with the sister, you know, thing basically with uh, what happened to his bro to her brother, and like using her dreams, like her visions, to help her out, right? Like, there's a moment where, like, there's some of the kids, like, one kid's, like, pointing, like, the dead kid, the ghost, right, kid? It's, like, pointing, but it's nothing, there's nothing there, though, because from his point of view, he's pointing from, like, it's, like, how do I put this? From his world, whatever, um, he's maybe pointing at nothing, though, but thing is where he's pointing where he's, like, and he's, like, he's at another place, right? We, the viewer, is, like, he's at another place where he's pointing, he's, like, a house or a person, right? So, while the kid is, like, seeming like he's pointing nothing, right, but he's actually pointing at something from outside uh, the house, like, a different place, right? And, at one point, the word the sister is, is, is learning all this, and eventually, it eventually leads to a house where all the bodies of the kids were buried, right? But, um, and also, the abuse of dad, 
the nitpick I have with this, I think he could have been just taken out of this movie because his him doesn't really lead to any doesn't really go nowhere. I mean, if you think though, if the kid, you think you know he would stand up for his dad though, but you know, hey, don't touch my sister again or whatever. I will hurt you or kill you or whatever, but that doesn't really happen though. So the guy, the whole thing with the the father, the abusive father, Jeremy Davis, doesn't really go anywhere. So I think that could have been just been just left out of the movie. And there's a point where even the the the, the was of all there was a kid who had um, martial did martial arts and was also and then another bully as well. Um. What else I would say? Because I want to give too. Because with this film, I don't want to feel like I want to give too much away. Although the ending, I'll say this: the ending is not a downbeat ending. I will say that it is not a downbeat ending. Very satisfying, you could say, to especially to the villain, to Ethan Hawke. And also, things also with Ethan Hawke's character, like he may have like like different, um, because he because he wears different masks. You know, the one that you see on the poster, and then he wears another mask. It makes like he have, may, may have multiple personalities, because he wears each different mask he wears. It has a different attitude, right? But, um... But he does need to get a good comeuppance, I would say. And then also, he, Ethan Hawke's character also had a brother who does, like, cocaine, though. I mean, he was kind of acting really silly. I mean, he does like when, when he gets the when he gets the lead kid Finney, he's like, "Oh, I thought you see what I got you." You know, the way he's talking is like, "Okay, that's like an off kilter type of moment, you know, for a movie like this, right?" And that's when Ethan Hawke really kills him with an axe to the head. But um. But a quick 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 shows that uh, the guy finally killed somebody. It was his own brother. But um. But overall, yeah, the film itself I did enjoy though, despite the couple of nitpicks here and there. But it's a, it was a downbeat ending. It didn't leave anything for a sequel at a bait bait ending. No. It didn't do that because thing is though, because a lot of times. There's no there's a lot of times there's no need to do a sequel for everything, right? This here was a de this way was a, it was a satisfying ending. It didn't leave no room for a sequel. It was a, it was not a downbeat ending at all. And the kids, the the two lead kids, uh, Finney and Gwen, the characters' names were, but um, the two leads, they they did a good did it they they both did a good job. I thought they were likable, and I felt sorry for the kids. Ethan Hawke, I think, did a really good job as the villain, the grabber. Scott Derrickson did a good job as well, and that's why I would love to see how his version, his horror version of the Multiverse of Madness would have been, you know. But no, studios, Marvel are just complete jackasses, you know. No, it's either it's either our way or the or the highway, basically. One thing I haven't, I haven't I haven't liked any Marvel films. How many straight Marvel films I've hated that hated from back starting from back from last year until 2021 until this year, especially the Multiverse of Madness and. Thor, Love and Thunder. Do you think I'm going to give a shit about uh, Wakanda Forever? I know they're, they're going to pay tribute to Chadwick Boseman, which was nice, you know, because it's sad, sad about that he passed away back in, um, um, 2020, you know. It's, it's, it does suck. So, yeah, it's nice that they're going to pay a tribute to him, I guess. But overall, the movie itself, you think I'm going to give a damn about uh, me liking Wakanda Forever since I've hated every single Marvel film from here to last year, you know? No. Ooh, Submariner's in it. Big freaking deal, okay? But for, 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 I'll probably end up seeing it anyway because my brother he buys he buys the tickets in advance, you know. So I'll probably end up seeing, I'll probably end up seeing it anyway. But hey, I didn't pay for it's free, you know, for me. Because my brother he always pays for these tickets, so I'm not gonna complain about that. <laughs> oh, you're cheapskate. No, I hey I pay a lot. Of, I paid money to go to see a lot of movies I did not like. Believe me. But and I, I did I, and but um 
but the, here, going back to this movie, I enjoy The Black Phone. It was a really well done movie. Scott Derrickson did a really good job with the movie. You know, like I said, how it takes place, how it does, mm -hmm. how the film takes place in the 1970s. I uh, I bought that. The production design was was good. Um, the score by Mark uh, Corv Corvin. The score by Mark by Mark by Mark Cor Corvin. I thought it fit the film well. Just to how just how it fits, like how it is, just how it does takes place in the nineteen seventies. So the the look of the movie was was well was was good too, along with the score. Um, the villain, like I said Ethan Hawke did a good job as the villain, the grabber. The two leads were the two lead kids were did a good job. Jeremy Davis is as the father. I mean, that's one of the weak. That's one of the weak points of the movie. Even with the, even the brother who the, the brother of Ethan Hawke who did the cocaine who was like off kilter of the movie, just silly. I don't think you need to put the brother in there anyway either. But the whole thing with the with the with the ghost kids with the phone, you know, and all that I liked, you know. Although, like I said, even though they, they were giving them clues how to get out of here, though, but they would all fail, though, because, I mean, come on, they all they would have to fail, because if there were, they would, then there would be no movie, right? <laughs> but, um, yeah, overall, I, I enjoy I enjoyed the Black Phone. I thought it was, um, the pacing, I thought, was it, uh, how long was this movie again? I forget. Because I think the pacing, I think, was a little bit too long. It's on, it's on for 103 minutes. So that was like basically 140, I think. Yeah, I mean an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah, I thought maybe. Well, at least it wasn't. At least it wasn't two hours long. So I'll give it that. It wasn't two hours long, because that because that's how a lot of films nowadays. So every film has to be two hour over two hours long. But I thought there was a little. I thought that. But even though despite being an hour and 40 minutes, I thought it was like a little bit slow. I know it was building up to it though. But for me, it felt like it was a bit slow though. Could have picked up a bit more. That was that. That was that's that's like another nitpick though. But overall, I did enjoy. I did enjoy the Black Phone. Will I put this on my favorite list this year? Sure, yes. I'll definitely put this on my list because films. I like, I've enjoyed. I've enjoyed a lot of films. I've been liking this year. Like the movie reviews from this year. I I I put on was films I enjoyed from this year. Except for, except for Doctor Strange two and Thor, which I ranted on. But. A lot of films I've reviewed, I, I've enjoyed this year. I enjoyed Sonic Two, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, um, a couple of a couple of other movies I enjoyed. Um, but this will put on it and Nope. I also, I just I just reviewed Nope, and I really surprisingly I enjoyed it. So yeah. So that's about my my review of Nope. Oh, the Black Phone, because I, I I said that because I just I just talked about the I just I just talked about Nope previously. So, yeah, but I overall the black phone I did enjoy. So, um, but anyway, thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next movie review for Halloween month of October, and we'll see you on the next video. Later.